Good morning, folks. Today is Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022. Welcome to episode number 232 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and providing expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize this today at work? Or if you're looking to break into the industry, you're going to get asked the question in every interview, how do you stay current? This is a fantastic answer. Now, shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors before we get into the program, Barricade Cyber Solutions and Recon InfoSec. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidences. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Link in the description below. Also want to give some love towards Recon InfoSec. Recon InfoSec's managed detection and response MDR offering includes the people, process, and technology needed to deliver full spectrum security operations to organizations of any size. Their MDR service includes fully managed SIM and SOAR, and customers gain full visibility into their own environment as well as any incident investigated being worked by the Recon SOC team. Thank you so much for sponsoring the stream Recon InfoSec and Barricade Cyber Solutions. Links to both of those companies and the services they provide in the show description below. I want to remind you if you hold professional certifications like CISSP, CISM, CISA, anything that really requires CPEs, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPT, CPE, two and a half a week, 10 a month, so they stack up. Definitely say what's up in chat to document literally the easiest and I would argue the most enjoyable way to earn CPEs. Guys, CPEs can suck. <laughs> this this doesn't suck. If you are live with us, love it. I see 67 of you creeping in here. Hopefully some more of us will get in here as we go. It is Worldwide Wednesday, so looking forward to jumping in that in a second. Thanks for being here. If you're on Team Replay, hashtag Team Replay in the comments. Thanks so much for catching the stream. I see your comments out there dropping heart love all over those comments. Appreciate it. Chris Weaver always giving uh, a follow-up analysis on some of the stories we cover. I appreciate that, Chris. But if you are on Team Replay and you want to jump right to the news when the when you know the next couple minutes when the when the screen changes, we're off and running, so you can jump there. Couple pops of 30 seconds each on the audio podcast app of choice. But if you're live, guess what we're about to ruck into? It is. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, Jeremy Williams with the super chat. I'll take a sip of coffee for that cup of coffee, Jeremy Williams. Thank you so much, sir. If you are live, we're about to do Worldwide Wednesday. So let me know in chat where you guys from. This is what we do every Wednesday if you're new here. We have the Simply Cyber community is so huge and just so awesome that we got people coming in from all over the globe. And right now we're going to see if we can prove it. Where are you at? Where are you at, Simply Cyber? Wisconsin's in the house. North America's online. Thanks, James Udakudo. All right. Lower Michigan's up in here. Pamela, good to see you. Texas is its own state, no doubt. Nathan Bolden. Representing West Virginia, Bill Donaldson in the low country, my man. Alicia Jerry from the great state of Georgia. Hey, yeah. We already have Asia. All right, Cyber Munchkin, I'll take that. Manchester, I'm going to assume that is UK. Ergo, Europe, South Africa. BSEC, you're not in South Africa. If somebody said South Africa, then all right. Tech, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, the Vatican. Are you serious? Vatican's in the house, tiniest country. Damn, love it. Ifu Luwapo Awada. Thank you so much, Vatican. So we got EU and the Vatican. We got North America. What else we got? Asia, because of Cyber Munchkin. Oh, okay. VPN and out of South Africa. That doesn't count. Canada's up in here. Nice job, Canada. Where are we at, South America? Where are we at, Africa? Internal stranger. Singapore's in the house. Asia's online. Thank you so much, Asia. South America, Africa, Australia. Where's my overlanders? Where's my Chris Rocks of the world? Internal strangers. We got about a minute and a half, y'all. Land of the Oz is in the house. Internal stranger represent. Thank you so much, internal stranger. We need South America. We need Africa. Where are we at? Where are we at, South America? Where are we at, Africa? 
I'm coming from the great state of South Carolina myself. Phoenix, Arizona coming in here. Louisiana. Love it. JLG representing Matthew Necci. Loving that dry heat. Come on, Chileans. That's right. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Guyana, Suriname, Dutch Guiana, or French Guiana. Where we at? Where we at? Come on. Tom Bishop's representing from Maryland. Love it. Hope the weather's there. Hey, George Fitzmaurice, good morning to you. Hey, Joe Bell, and all about those Carolinas. All right, Jamila's coming in from Germany. Europe is strong today. Where are we at, Africa? Where are we at, South America? We got 39 seconds, y'all. Leonardo coming in from the Dominican. So the Caribbean's online. Yes, Caribbean. Nigeria. Prophet Okori, thank you. Africa's online. Where's my South America people? Cordoba, Argentina. All right, y'all. We did it. Well done, team. Well done, team. Fantastic. All right. Well, that was a highly successful Worldwide Wednesday. Love it, love it, love it. You guys are the best. Now, let's sit back and collect our just rewards as we dig in to the top cyber news of the day. Sit back, relax. Let's have a good time. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022. LockBit dominates ransomware. According to Deep Instinct's 2022 interim cyber threat report, LockBit accounted for 44% of all ransomware campaigns in the year so far. This compares to 23% of campaigns attributed to Conti and 21% to Hive. The report also corroborated trends we've seen in 2022, like threat actors increasingly turning away from the use of document files to spread malware to using LNK and other archive email attachments. This comes as a result of Microsoft disabling macros by default in Office documents. The report also predicted a rise in so-called protestware over the next 12 months, with organizations self-sabotaging its software to weaponize it as malware. Wow. Okay. That is uh, interesting and wild. So, you know, there were some significant uh, developments in the space uh, in 2022, notably as they call out in, in the story. Um, macros were basically disabled, but then we came up with the Felina vulnerability and people were kind of working around that. LNK attachments, HTMA or a HTMA right? Like it, it looks like a web file, but it's actually like kind of a archive or an executable. Those are kind of getting sent around. Multi-factor authentication is getting turned on a lot more uh, just because of, you know, the sheer amount of focus being provided to it. So we're winning. Threat actors, no surprise, are uh, adapting and moving around. What I find interesting, okay, uh, for, for for something to take action, guys, for those of you in the industry, something to take action today or to take back to your team, LockBit ransomware makes up almost half, almost half of all ransomware campaigns this year, right? So, you know, if you've got only a dollar to spend on your information security program, it might be worth the investment to put it towards... Um, like looking at LockBits TTPs. Now, I always say this, thank you, Joel Belton with the HTA. I always say this on stream and I mean it. You should not be building an information security program that protects from a specific ransomware threat actor. Like, you know what I mean? Like you should be building fundamental pieces of best practices, you know, um, least privilege if you can do that. Multi-factor authentication, security awareness, EDR, SIM, SOAR, SOAR is not even really necessary, but having security operations capabilities, right? Once you've got the basics, right, then you can start doing, you know, specialized, like, okay, so LockBits TTPs are this, this, and this. They use PowerShell. Okay, so like, let's put some more detections. Let's engineer the SIM to look for kind of couplings of PowerShell things being run or, you know, obfuscated code being pushed in PowerShell or what, whatever. My, my point is, I feel like it's a little, um, it, it, it's like, it's like trying to have like, um, if, if you're building your program to block from LockBit exclusively and you haven't done the fundamentals, it's like putting like $10,000 rims on a beater car, right? Like it doesn't just get a better car 
and then focus on, you know, the, 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 the finer points, right? Um, it, you know, it's like, it's like simply cyber, right? It'd be like, instead of me trying to fix the audio to begin with, and I just bought like, you know, nice equipment, but the audio still sucked. It wouldn't make any sense. Right. So anyways, long story short, I would go to miter attack. Um, let me see lockbit. I'm actually kind of curious of lockbit, um, TTPs. So yeah, just real quick spot, uh, real quick, just Google search and you can get lockbits TTPs pretty quickly. Um, you know, I know Eric Taylor in chat does a lot with lockbit, <laughs> uh, since he does incident response. So, uh, interesting stuff here. What is surprising is that Conti is second at 23% and Conti like basically blew up in March. So th that just goes to show like, this is another kind of a side that just goes to show you how freaking busy Conti was in the first three months of 2022 that they still hold second place and they basically imploded when Russia invaded Ukraine. Right. So kind of crazy. I mean, good for us, I suppose like that, that was uh, a benefit, unexpected collateral damage for, for the good guys that Conti imploded. CISA on voting integrity. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency said the agency and Biden administration have done everything we can to protect election infrastructure ahead of Election Day. Director Jen Easterly said CISA received no information credible or specific about efforts to disrupt or compromise election systems, saying that any information out there is disinformation meant to sow discord among Americans. Easterly also said the administration remained concerned about Russia and Iran and China trying to influence our elections. She cautioned there will be errors or glitches in some places, but that such things have happened in every election. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, Leonardo shared an APT simulator from Nextron Systems that might be able to help you look at lockbits. TTP is very cool. Okay, so I again, you know, guys, if, you, if you're a regular here, if you're a squad member, you know I, I don't like to wade into the political waters. This is a cybersecurity show, not a, you know, platform for spouting uh, my political views. So election conspiracy theories are starting to run rampant. I've already heard certain, you know, I've heard, I've already heard certain reports that, you know, if, if this person doesn't win, it means that the election was, was rigged. Um, so I've heard those type of things. I've also heard like, oh, you know, like, you know, these things can be hacked. We have seen multiple times, uh, there's a election hacking or a hacking vote hacking village at DEF CON has been for years. Um, Usually the hacks are like, you'd have to like physically get into the voting machine and like take it apart, like which no, no one's going to let you do at the voting booths and stuff like that. So, um, there are attacks, but it's not really. And so, and I think a lot of the efficacy of United States adversaries around tainting the midterm elections or the main elections in, in two years from now is more around sowing, um, malcontent discontent among the populace less of a technical hack and more of a social engineering tack at scale i do want to point out that i saw i saw um jen easterly so guys i'm a huge jen easterly fan if i could get her on simply cyber i would i'm sure that won't happen <laughs> but I, i'm a huge jen easterly fan i love what she's doing for sisa if you don't know who jen easterly is she is the director of sisa she's been in in that position for maybe a year and she's already making like tons of headway, public private sector partnerships, um, the known vulnerabilities, <clears throat> known exploited vulnerabilities list that gets updated regularly. She goes to DEF CON, she's super accessible, super cool. And she's one of us, frankly, that she's not a, <laughs> she's not a bureaucrat. She's one of us. She's a cybersecurity professional who happens to be in a position of power to influence things. I saw her, she's usually like, I don't want to say she's like a hippie, but she's usually pretty chill and like not stuffy suit person and i saw her on uh an interview like cnn or one of those the other day and she was dressed very proper and the conversation was all around election you know uh manipulation election fraud adversaries and she you know it, i feel like it was not it was not propaganda right because i believe what she said was true but it was definitely a focused deliberate um message to uh console americans she said listen let me start off by saying we have no credible information the intelligence community in the united states has no credible information at this time that there's any adversary 
tampering with the elections in the United States. So they're coming at it from like, you know, a messaging perspective. They're coming at it from a technical perspective. They are looking at these things. So uh, this is just con a continued part of that um, messaging, frankly, to um, instill confidence and, and to let people know that, you know, we're working on it. There's there's working being done on this uh, because guys, if, if the integrity of the election gets compromised in the United States, like at like at mass, We've got big problems in the United States because this is this is such a foundational piece of how the hell our government operates. All right. A call for more ransomware reporting. If you listen to cybersecurity headlines every day, it may seem like quite a few ransomware attacks get reported. We talk about them all the time. But according to the National Cybersecurity Center annual review in the UK for 2022, many ransomware events required a nationally coordinated response in the year. But getting a handle on the true scope of ransomware remains problematic due to spotty reporting. A lack of reporting gives attackers more leverage to demand payment for not leaking exfiltrated data, even with little guarantee that cyber criminals will keep their word. Rather than something being hushed up, the report recommends that organizations treat cybersecurity as a genuine board level risk to be managed. OK, so this story is all about the UK only. But guys, I would argue, I mean, God, hey, anyone who's worked incident response, you've seen this look before, right? If you're if you're watching on the video, not listening, uh, there's a woman with her head in her hands. <laughs> and this is definitely the look of someone who just has finally internalized that their files are being held ransom. A uh, great photo choice by the editor. All right. So this story is about the UK, but I would argue that this probably is transferable across different countries, different business sectors, different verticals. Um, yeah, if you get hit with ransomware, uh, you get hit. And we just talked about the story here. 44% was locked bid in 2022. But at the same time, not everybody's reporting it. And it makes sense, guys. If you're a small business, if you don't know what's going on and you get hit, like you might just be like, okay, I'm just go buy a new computer, right? Like small business, you, you can move really fast, very agile. So it's possible that these things are happening. What I would point out is they say the true impact is unclear because some victims aren't disclosing. I would argue that in 2022, many, many businesses are uh, getting cyber insurance. It's like part of their business insurance, right? So you have, uh, uh, you have like the uh, errors and omissions insurance. You have the insurance like slip and fall. Like basically you get insurance. So if you get sued, you're good to go. Most insurance companies at this time are now, you know, offering cyber insurance or putting it as a rider as part of your main policy. The only way to cash in on that is if you tell the insurance company that you suffered a ransomware incident, right? And they're going to get involved and it will get reported that way. So I would, you know, I would argue, yes, there is a potential that the true impact of ransomware is unclear. But in reality, I would, I would think a majority of individuals are reporting because it's part of the process of getting paid out on your insurance. And guys, I tell you this all the time. Straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. Guys, if you get hit for ransomware and you have to pay like a hundred thousand dollar ransom, right? And you can call in insurance and they'll give you the hundred thousand dollar back. There isn't a single person in chat. There's 125 of us here right now. There isn't a single one of us unless we're running an illegal business and then we wouldn't have insurance anyways. There's not one of us that wouldn't call it in and get paid back. That's the point of insurance to be made whole. And if that means reporting it, fine, report it. Cut me my check. I need to get back to work. Straight cash, homie. So, you know, I while I can make an argument while the impact is unclear, I would argue that it is actually much clearer than many people would um, suspect. Now, don't get me wrong. Five years ago, uh -uh, like publicly traded companies, Uber, are getting hacked and not telling anyone. OK, but in today's day and age with insurance and in reporting and stuff like that, you're not getting away from it. Twitter content moderation teams limited ahead of elections. Bloomberg sources say that many Twitter employees on its trust and safety teams are unable to alter or penalize accounts breaking rules around misinformation and hate speech. The only exception appears to be for high impact violations involving real world harm, which received manual review. Some workers received access to internal tools over the weekend to enforce policies around Brazil's presidential election, but only in a limited capacity. Twitter's automated tools remain in effect, but taking action on them requires human input, which they currently don't have access for. 
Twitter partner Data Miner noted that over the weekend, the site saw a 1,700% spike in the use of a racist slur on the platform. Okay, so this is what I was talking about yesterday, okay? Like, you know, this is a personal story, whatever. Like, my aunt Donna, uh, I spoke to yesterday, and she told me she's getting off the platform, Twitter, um, because she said she just... <laughs> she started using it yesterday or two days ago and just saw all sorts of, um, you know, very, very racist, uh, comments around one particular, um, type. And she's like, I just, this isn't, I can't be on this platform anymore. It's not, I, it's, it's, it's uh, upsetting me. So anyways, that's happening as they just stated in the story. Now, what's really interesting is twofold. One, you got to remember, it's not just U.S. elections. Twitter is an international platform. So Brazil's elections, Argentina, there's a coup, Turkey, right? The people in Turkey, when they had a revolution uh, four years ago, they used Twitter to coordinate their revolution. It is a powerful platform that is far reaching. Now, Elon came in. Uh, let me hold on. I don't get to say Elon enough. Let me put an Elon up in here. Elon came in. And I don't think he has fired 75% uh, of staff right now. Uh, there was talk about him doing that. But if all of this content moderation has a human that has to review it, so the, the AI just flags it like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And then someone has to look at it and go, yes, it is bad. Yes, it is bad. No, nah, it's not bad. First of all, that's a human being subjective, but I get it, right? I've had Simply Cyber YouTube videos uh, struck by AI when I thought it was total horse crap that they struck it. And a human reviewed it and ultimately reversed the strike. So I get why there's a human review. But if you kneecap the staff at the business, then it's just getting flagged and it's not being disposed on. And it sounds like when they flag it, it still continues to exist in the stream and it only gets removed or blocked or restricted or taken down if it is in fact validated as breaking uh, you you know end user user uh, end user terms or whatever like content terms or whatever whatever the terms are the policy. So basically, <laughs> Joe Belton. So basically, what it sounds like is Twitter is slowly like hold on. You know what Twitter sounds like? Uh, where are we at? Doing 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 doing. There we go in chat. Dumpster fire. Right. They they have these things in place, but it's a hot mess on fire. And oh by the way, um. Guys, I tell you this all the time. This is a slightly bigger picture. Like, yes, we all work for companies, or many of us do, and many of us are trying to get into the industry, right? I work for ThreatGen. I do good work for ThreatGen. I care about ThreatGen. I want ThreatGen to do well. But I am CEO of me, right? Because ThreatGen, they hit a speed bump in the road, and they need to save costs Sorry, Jerry, like, love you, mean it, you're fired, right? It's not, it's not personal, it's just business, right? So you've got to remember that it you have to take care of you, right? Maslow's pyramid of needs, right? So you got to take care of you. So why do I say all this, Jerry? Because Elon Musk told many people last week, hey, I want this $20 blue checkmark thing put in place. And if it's not in place by this date, you're fired. Period, end of story. So if you give me a task where you say, if I do not complete it, I'm fired. I can guarantee you, a hundred percent of my focus will be on completing that task and that task alone. Going to look at content moderation stuff is not in my, it, I have a perverse incentive not to go look at it. Do you see what I'm saying? So there, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. Uh, and it sucks, for, unfortunately, because <clears throat> a lot of people go to Twitter. I go to Twitter. So. And now thanks to this week's episode sponsor, Votero. UFOs are everywhere. They're in your applications, cloud storage, endpoints, and emails. That's right, UFOs, unidentified file objects, are hiding in files across your organization. UFOs can contain malware that exfiltrates data or deploys ransomware. And 70% of UFOs can't be detected by traditional scanning solutions like antivirus and sandboxing. That's where Votero comes in. Votero prevents UFOs before they hitch a ride in on files, without detection and without slowing down business. Do you believe? Learn more at votero.com slash UFOs. That's V-O-T-I-R-O dot com slash UFOs. All right, let's do this. Obviously, you know what time it is.
All right, we're at the mid-roll. It is David Meese Try Hack Me Raffle Week, and today is no different. And I've got, if you're on Team Replay, pay close attention because i got some special news for you too. Guys, we're going to be raffling off right now two premium subscriptions to Try Hack Me. Try Hack Me is this platform. Um, many people know about it, but if you don't, it allows you to learn, hack boxes, get educated. It's a really cool platform. Um, right now, if you'd like to... Um, Enter the raffle. It's open to everybody. Go ahead and hit THM in chat. Okay, all right. So we've got some regulars here. Everybody knew what the code word was. THM in chat. I see you queuing up. You guys are great. All right, so while that's queuing up, I want to remind everybody that if you'd like to get a newsletter written from me, and I call it newsletter, but it's basically a pointed email that gives you three pieces of actionable intel every single Monday morning where you can basically do more you can deliver cyber risk reducing value to your organization first thing monday morning if you get this newsletter go to simplycyber.io slash newsletter and start kicking major butt at work this monday later today at 11 30 a.m eastern time so three hours from today i will be going live on the threat gen stream uh we've got a different uh type of stream today we're going to be talking about how you can learn red team cybersecurity in a gamified way with a guided walkthrough. If you've played Threat Gen Red versus Blue and you've gotten a little bit confused on how it can work, we have one of the most seasoned players coming on stream who is not a cybersecurity professional, and he is going to play in a guided walkthrough way on what his thought process is, why he does certain things. And I will be... Um, facilitating and discussing about the real world cybersecurity implications of the decisions he's making. So it'll be a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about the game itself, the mechanics of the game, and how real world cybersecurity practices get involved. That's why it's like a, a, a chalkboard. Uh, I, I made this thumbnail, right? So, all right. Yeah, we could play BSAC. We'll, we'll schedule that up. All right, guys. Uh, the final thing I want to share with you is if you are, well, let's, let's do the raffle really quickly and, and then I'll explain how Team Replay can get involved in the raffle. So let's go. Good luck to everybody. 64 people in. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Let's go. Emmanuel O. Emmanuel O. Congratulations, Emmanuel O. You have won a month of premium service at Try Hack Me. Thank you, David Meese. All right, here we go. We've got a couple people still kind of dropping in here with the THM. All right, before I, I pick the next one, I'll give people a second. Guys, if you are on Team Replay, I want you to know that you can go tomorrow's drawing, Thursday, November 3rd's drawing, for two Try Hack Me premium subscriptions will be done through the discord server if you'd like to win you have to enter on the discord server i'm going to show a really quick video on how that can be done pay attention you go to the discord server giveaway channel and click on the emote here's a quick little video showing it get the invite you're in the simply cyber discord the giveaway channel All right, so hopefully you saw that. Just go to the Discord, go to the giveaway channel. The, the server will automatically select the winners at 10.30 tomorrow while we're on stream. So enter to win Team Replay. You guys know I love Team Replay. I don't, I don't want to marginalize them. All right, let's pick the, the final winner and get back to the news. Winner, winner, Brave Robot squad member. Thank you so much, Brave Robot. Love having you here. Congratulations on the win. You guys did wonderful. Good job. Good job. Let me take a quick note here. Emmanuel and Brave Robot. Connect with me on Discord to get your prize. All right, y'all. Let's get back into the news. UK Intel helping defend Ukraine. The British government confirmed that its GCHQ intelligence agency contributes to Ukraine's defense against ongoing Russian cyber attacks. The Foreign Office provided 6.35 million pounds as part of the Ukraine Cyber Program support package back in February. 
Part of GCHQ's support includes providing incident response support for Ukraine's government, as well as accessing hardware and software solutions. The U.S. Cyber Command previously confirmed it deployed staff in Ukraine ahead of Russia's invasion to provide similar support. What? Hold on, I'm trying to see this. So basically, I mean, it's not a surprise, right, that the U.K., has been helping Ukraine, right? That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but they typically don't want to publicize that. And it sounds like they had to do the, like their annual budget, <laughs> their annual budget reporting. And it came out that they had spent 7.3 million US dollars uh, in a support package for Ukraine. So I don't know exactly what that means. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't try to like relabel that or you know, call it international efforts or do anything other than call it Ukraine cyber program. But, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Um, let's see. Providing IR support to the Ukrainian government, including uh, protections against in destroyer to malware. Um, I'm just reading here. The U.S. has been involved. So it sounds like they're not. OK, so this is kind of cool. So it sounds like the program is more like. um don't I don't want to call it like Peace Corps, but think of it as almost the way I'm reading this. Think of it as almost like cyber medics, right? So in a traditional kinetic warfare, you've got, you know, left side, right side, you know, whatever, Axis allies, whatever. And they're shooting at each other uh, across like two trenches, right? Hold on. Uh, this is at least this is how I'm seeing it. They're shooting at each other across the trenches. And then when someone gets shot, you know, a medic runs in, whether they're uh, for one side or the other, or they're just like an international media, I'm uh, not media, medium, where they're like, hey, we're not on anyone's side. We're Switzerland. We're just trying to be cool about things. And they drag the person somewhere safe to get the medical attention, right? War is hell. But, you know, this sounds like that's what UK is doing. So like, you know, they're, they're standing by the ready. They're not saying we're overtly helping Ukraine. They're not saying, hey, like we're going to launch you know, low orbit ion cannon to take us back to the 90s. We're not going to launch low orbit ion cannon from um, um, at Downton Abbey Street or whatever. Um, I, I'm so uncultured when it comes to Europe. Uh, from, from uh, you know, Parliament into uh, the Kremlin, right? We're not going to do that. But if a Ukrainian website gets knocked over, we're going to run onto the battlefield and help them get that website stood back up. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, which I don't think violates any of the rules around, you know, Russia's got these like pretty wide rules of like, if anyone helps Ukraine, we're going to, you know, exact our, we're going to attack them as well. So this is an interesting dicey way to handle that. Uh, but it's cool. No surprise, right? Open SSL patches out. The widely used internet standard Open SSL released versions 1.1.1s and 3.0.7 to address security vulnerabilities. The 3.0.7 version patches a highly publicized security flaw, although Open SSL downgraded the severity from critical to high after discovery. However, in the process of patching it, developers discovered a second high severity bug, which was also patched in the release. Both bugs were exposed during TLS certificate verification, vulnerable to malformed TLS certificates to create a stack overflow. These would be hard to exploit for remote code execution, but could easily be weaponized into a denial of service attack. Okay, so, yes, okay. There's a bigger story here, okay? Open SSL patches out. If you can patch it, um, it was you know, marked critical. Now they're saying hi, but they found a second vulnerability. So that needs, and that got patched too. So you should treat this as part of your normal vulnerability management program. Obviously guys, I'm a huge advocate and I hope you are too, that your external facing um, IT infrastructure, whether it's, you know, Citrix server or VPN concentrator, I don't care. If somebody from a Starbucks in South Korea can hit your anything, that needs to be a prioritized um, asset for vulnerability management, simply because if you stand up a honeypot on the internet and watch it for more than 30 seconds, like you go get a cup of coffee and come back, it's going to be banged on already. Okay. So it, these things happen. That's why it's a priority. Now, what the bigger thing I want to complain about, <laughs> the bigger thing I want to complain about is we, we don't always get it right. Okay. We don't always get it right. But there seems to be a pattern in our industry, you know, and you, you, you have lack of information in order to make an informed decision. But every once in a while, 
like a vulnerability gets uh, disclosed or it, it, like it gets teased. Like last week, in two, two weeks ago and then last week, everybody was talking about, oh my God, like clear your schedule, open SSL vulnerability. There's a patch coming out. It's undisclosed. Uh, they're working on the patch. They don't want people to know. It's going to be big. This is big as Heartbleed, Heartbleed 2.0, right? Like, like it was getting pumped like it was the boogeyman. And then it comes out and it's like, oh, I was actually downgraded to high. I saw Dave Kennedy. I think it was Dave Kennedy on Twitter point out or Mick Douglas point out that, oh, no, no, it was Bryson Bort point out that like in order for this vulnerability to actually be compromised, you'd actually have to compromise the client workstation that's connecting to the SSL certificate. So it's, it's like a much more involved exploitation path. You know, it's not just like push a button and, and like you own, you know, you, you own the jewels, right? Like it, it, it's complicated. Um, even if you know what you're doing and, 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 and want to execute and exploit this, like, I'm not saying that there would be easier ways to do it, but I just think it's not as high as drop everything, shove a baby to the side, uh, or like, you know, shove a child out of the way as you're running to, you know, the server closet to, to get these things patched. Okay. So, uh, it happens from time to time in our industry, you know, log four J was kind of another one. Uh, it was because log four J was like, there was a lot around log four J. We didn't know where it was. It was super easy to exploit. Anyone could do it from anywhere. It was on the helicopter on Mars. So I'm not saying log four J got blown out of proportion, but if you look at like what seems to be the impact from log four J being exploited in the wild, you know, in the months following the release of the vulnerability, it, it didn't seem to be, um, you know, a correlation between the hype that was behind it and the impact on the organization. Whereas, whereas, by the way, like, guys, when Vault 7 leak, when when Shadow Brokers broke into the NSA and stole the, the their tools and released it in the Vault 7 leak and Eternal Blue came out, Right. If you don't know what I'm talking about, basically the way WannaCry was so crazy successful at blowing up everything was because it used a wicked awesome precision weapon developed by the NSA that got leaked called Eternal Blue. And th that leak happened in like January of 2017 and WannaCry exploded in March and the patch had already been out, right? And, but people weren't like, ah, oh, you got to patch it, right? Like you should have patched it, but did you see what I'm saying? So, so like, don't always you do, you have, okay. You have to do your own work. You have to do your own work to look at what vulnerabilities are out there. Look at your own infrastructure and make risk-based decisions. Yes. Fancy. GRC people are humans too. Okay. We, we are real people. You have to do a risk analysis on how important is this to my organization? Don't believe, don't, don't just buy the hype and be like, okay, like you have to do the work. That's part of the job, y'all. That's part of the job. Sandstrike spyware hits Android. Researchers at Kaspersky highlighted this new spyware, which focuses on the Persian speaking practitioners of the Baha'i faith. Attackers began spreading a malicious VPN app on social media accounts marketed as a way to get around religious censorship. Adds a link back to telegram channels to download the app. The app actually does operate its own VPN infrastructure, but also installs the spyware, exfiltrating sensitive data like call logs and contact lists. It's unclear what specific threat group operates Sandstrike. CISA publishes... Uh, hold on. So... Do, do, do. Yeah, dude, anytime you're getting... Okay, so this is basically a malicious VPN, uh, and they're using social engineering to convince people to go download it and install it. And basically, it might be some VPN-type um, mechanism. So it's like a Trojan. You know, a Trojan piece of software basically means it delivers some some service, some value, but it's also doing something else, a la the Trojan horse, right? Um, here's my thing. This, You know what? This is an actual opportunity to educate not just ourselves, but our end users, okay? Now, and by the way, this is targeting Persian-speaking countries, Middle Eastern. So I know a lot of us in here are uh, U.S.-based, and this doesn't apply. But if you are working in the Middle East, if you are supporting uh, Persian-speaking countries, you know, UAE. I know CyberSec Mom is uh, UAE. Like, be mindful of this. But there is a bigger picture lesson here. Okay? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. 
look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Sure. I'm the captain now. You have, like, educate your end users. If you ever get directed to a Telegram channel to download software, that should be an indicator that something is not right. That should be, that should be, like, y you should, you should be getting some tummy troubles, okay? You should be feeling a little like, huh, something's not right. Yeah. Like, if you, like, go to a house, Halloween just happened, and trick or treat, and you ring the doorbell and you're like, trick or treat. And the person opens the door and they're like, oh yeah, no problem. Just go around the side of the house behind the trash cans. That's where we're giving out candy. Wouldn't you be like, um, no, I'll just go on to the next house. I'll just go on to the Google Play store next door. I'll just go this way to the app store <laughs> over here. I'm all set with your trash candy. Uh, okay, so it's just, it's the equivalent, right guys? Do not... Do not get sent to Telegram. I hear so many stories of people getting fired over to Telegram and then downloading stuff. Like, what are you doing? Don't do that. I'm looking at you, Carl. MFA guidelines. The agency published two fact sheets on the subject, urging all organizations to implement multi-factor authentication as a way to protect against phishing and other advanced cyber threats. One fact sheet deals with ways threat actors can get around limited MFA implementations using things like phishing, push notification fatigue, and SIM swapping. It recommends using MFA solutions based on FIDO and public key infrastructure. The other further outlines how to defend push notification based MFA if it's the only option available, specifically highlighting number matching. CISA says this approach helps mitigate MFA fatigue in users. Yeah. By the Okay, so hey, a uh, new term for me, push bombing. I can't highlight it because I don't know why the web page is, it's like a picture of the text. This must be some mechanism for their, for them to protect people scraping their web pages. This is literally a picture of the text. Um, so push bombing is a new term for me. Um, okay, here's the TLDR. We we've we've tried so hard for years to get people to implement MFA, and I feel like we're 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 far enough along where we don't have to make the tough sell to leadership or to end users that MFA is a good idea and we should do it, right? For years, I feel like we've been um, camping and like we set up the tent, but the CIO is like, ha ha, I'm not going to give you any of these uh, tent poles. You figure it out, CISO. And then like, you're just like kind of holding the tent up while your end users sleep at night. And you're like, this sucks, right? Well, we finally got the tent poles. We built the tent, but now like, like, let's not a good, you can't, you can't rest on your laurels, y'all. You need to be like, okay, so now let's, mo like, let's choose the best MFA options that we can. And CISA has released this guidance. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to walk this road alone. Okay. You have information from a federal authority that you can use to a inform yourself and then B uh, get buy-in from leadership and stuff around the different MFAs. Right? So guys, real quick, if you're new here, MFA multi-factor authentication, it's, it's after you do a username and password, right? You, you get something else, but you can do it all sorts of ways. You can get a phone call. You can get a text message. You can do a six digit um, app. You can get a pop-up that says, did you just do this approved decline? Right? You you can um you can have a hardware token with a six digit thing, right? You can get um a, what else? I guess a text message. You can get an email, right? And many of us already configured. But but the the thing is, you could do uh, biometrics too. The thing is, it can come in many different forms. And it used to be we didn't care. We were just like, please do a second factor. Your password sucks. Please just do a second factor. And we got that. But now with things like push bombing where like your phone is basically a denial of service attack because it's just like did you uh approve decline approve decline approve decline approve decline two things one you don't want your end users to do a uh, deal with that so you should opt for um a, a, a better multi-factor authentication option if you have the option right you you have to choose the best one that you have if you only have the push uh, notifications and that's all you have it's better than nothing but you should also Educate your end users that if they, th like, you should do this. We will never tell you, like, hey, dear end user, we will never tell you that we are working on our multi-factor system and that you could get a bunch of messages. A. B. If you're getting a ton of things around approving your multi-factor authentication, that means you've been compromised. It means your crap password has been found out. Don't say it that way. 
but you've been compromised. Let us know. Tell me. Text me. Send me an email. Call help desk. Do something, man. Whatever you do, don't hit approve because you're basically holding the door for the threat actors. And you don't want to do that. I don't want you to do that. Don't be that guy. Okay? Don't be that guy. All right. Looks like we're right a couple minutes over. A couple minutes over, but that's okay. All right. That's going to do it for the news today. I hope you guys had a good time. Congratulations to our winners, Emmanuel O and Brave Robot. Connect with me on Discord. Guys, I don't know... If you want, um, it looks like if you're a member of the Simply Cyber Discord server and you happen to have boosts and you'd like to support the server, please come on in here and push a boost. I think I'm pushing like four, four boosts here, but we're going to lose our level three perk in two days and 16 hours if we don't get one more boost. So if you have them, consider dropping them. Um, much love and appreciation if you do choose to do that. If not, just come on over to the Discord server. It's a good time all together. Reminder, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time today, we will be doing the Let's Play uh, with Alex Goodwin. It'll be uh, it'll be paired on a Simply Cyber, so you can check it here uh, if you want. Go to the Discord server and enter the giveaway if you're watching this on replay. Please go do that, okay? Guys, we had a great time today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jeff. Witala, Cybersecurity Central. I'm asking for the boost on Discord. If you go to the Discord server, uh, you'll see what boosting is. And Oh, Eric Taylor just boosted it. Thank you, Eric Taylor. Okay. And we're good. <laughs> Thank you, Eric Taylor of Barricade Cyber Solutions. The boost has been boosted. All right, everybody, have a great day. David Meese, thank you for the Try Hack Me. Guys, go on and enter the raffle for Try Hack Me, please. Uh, Amina Lawal, go just do exclamation point Discord to find the Discord server. My name on Discord is literally Gerald Ozier, Simply Cyber. I'm very overt out there on the Discord server. Uh, you can catch me anytime. Have a good one, Nathan Bolin. Have a good one, Daniel Grimes. Ahmed Haram, thanks so much for the squad support and great to see you. Hey, Kimberly, have a great day. Cyber Munchkin, looking forward to seeing you later. Infosec Kid with the coffees. Good to see you. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. All right. Hey, I found you, Carmen San Diego. What a perfect name for Worldwide Wednesday. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Could be anywhere, but we've got squad members everywhere up in the world. Thanks to Worldwide Wednesday. All right, guys, be good. Stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time for the daily briefing and the later today at 1130 a.m. for the Threat Gen Let's Play. Be good, everyone. Ha <laughs> ha